Michel Foucault is one of the most influential thinkers of our age. Since his death of AIDS in 1984, he has acquired an almost mythical status. For my money, Foucault is easily the most important intellectual in post-war Europe. A lone figure exploring the dark labyrinths of modern experience, madness, criminality, perversion. He was constantly feeling he was on the edge of something, constantly trying to reach the limit. A man loathed almost as much as he is revered. Every single sentence I regard as a lie. As a scholar, I have total contempt for Foucault. Along with Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault is usually linked with a post-war generation of French thinkers whose ideas about language helped shape our understanding of the postmodern world. Le comportement criminel, le comportement de délinquance, la transgression des lois sont des comportements en eux-mêmes trop complexes dont on connaît trop mal les déterminations. Foucault, however, was unique. He went beyond language to examine the nature of society itself the nature of man. He was interested in what lay beyond what we accept as normal and natural and the way transgression and deviancy can take us there. Furthermore, as no fewer than three biographies published in English this year have revealed, Foucault's interest in such themes was more than merely academic. One book in particular has aroused controversy for dwelling on how Foucault himself transgressed, how his life became a deeply personal quest into a world beyond good and evil. Foucault uh, was preoccupied with uh, exploring uh, states uh, that were beyond normal everyday experience. Uh, drugs was one such uh, realm of experience. Uh, certain forms of eroticism uh, would create uh, unusual sensations. And that was important for him as a way of reconfiguring and reimagining uh, the world and his place in the world. Eroticism, drugs, the realm beyond normal experience, these are unusual themes for a modern philosopher. In the first few decades of this century, academic philosophy more or less abandoned trying to tackle issues that dealt with life and how it should be lived, preferring instead to concentrate on the more analytical business of linguistics and logic. Since that time, the important questions about what it means to be a human being have taken place in other activities, art, politics, literature, social sciences. Michel Foucault is one of those rare people who was able to take the really, truly important questions about what it means to, to be a human being in the 20th century and to go out into the world and examine in detail aspects of our daily life from the way we make our bodies, to the way we make our lives, to the way we govern each other, to the way we fight, to the way we fuck, to the way we, we do everything, and re-raise those questions in a way that makes us pause and stop and think about the kind of beings that we are and whether we want to be like that. By digging through history, engaging in what he called an archaeology of knowledge, Foucault questioned fundamental assumptions about modern experience, the assumptions that form the basis of the distinction between good and bad, sanity and madness, normality and sexual deviancy. Foucault is the great explorer of the perverse. Foucault takes the traditional victims of history, the mad, the perverts, the, the bad, the sinful, the criminal, etc., doesn't romanticize them. He avoids doing that. But he actually shows that within them, there is a mirror image of society. For Foucault, however, such themes had to be explored through personal experience as well as scholarly research. This is why his life story acquires such a special significance. It too was one of his works, perhaps his most important, and one the biographies are revealing to have been every bit as experimental and challenging as his ideas. 
Foucault was born in the prosperous provincial French town of Poitiers in 1926 to upper middle class parents. He was christened Paul Michel after his father, a respected local surgeon. C'était la vie de euh, bourgeois de province, euh, une vie excessivement euh, réglée par euh, toutes les obligations euh, mondaines euh, qu'avaient mes parents et les principes d'éducation que euh, mes parents avaient reçu eux-mêmes de, de leurs euh, parents et grands-parents. Little is known about Foucault's upbringing that reveals the roots of his subsequent philosophical quest. However, a puzzling clue emerged in 1988 in the form of a short story by Hervé Guibert, a novelist who himself became famous in France for filming his own death from AIDS and who was claimed by some to be the last man to see Foucault alive. The story was written as a work of fiction, but one that appeared to contain a coded account of the hitherto secret formative experiences of Foucault's early life, raising speculation that Foucault had chosen to confide these secrets to Guibert in his final hours. The tale concerned the dissection of a philosopher's brain. Digging a little, one found vast stores, reserves of secrets, memories of childhood, novel theories. The memories of childhood had been buried more deeply than anything else in order not to come up against the idiocy of interpretations or the dubious craftsmanship of the large, deceptively luminous veil that would drape the work. In the sanctuary of his vessels lurked two or three images, like terrible dioramas. One of the images was of a young boy forced by his surgeon father to witness an amputation in order to prove his virility an ordeal that Foucault may well have experienced, though there's no independent confirmation that he did. Another image relates to an episode that, if true, might shed light on Foucault's adult preoccupation with confinement and crime. It tells of the boy's excitement at walking past a local courtyard, famous as the location of the woman known as the Sequester de Poitiers. What makes this story convincing is that there really had been such a woman, discovered in 1901, locked by her upper-class family in a windowless room, with scarcely enough food to survive, living in excrement and covered with lice. Surveying the room, officials discovered an inscription scrawled on the walls. To create beauty, not out of love or liberty, but solitude forever, you must live and die in a dungeon. I came across Guy Bear's short story at the very end of writing my book, and the feeling I had as I read the short story uh, was a shock of recognition. And in my bones, I thought, this is true. But of course, there was no way to say, this is true. And in a certain sense, I had to distrust the response because the stories were too perfect. And I set about uh, trying to establish the possible veracity of these stories. And all of the stories that uh, Guy Bear tells are plausible. And there's a way in which I think they probably are true. But what's most wonderful about them in the Guy Bear story is that they're rendered in the form of a fiction that makes them not directly available to uh, be plugged into an easy uh, biography, an easy kind of pseudo-Freudian reduction of a life. And that seemed like a wonderful gesture by Guibert as a writer uh, to his dead friend. By teasing biographers with these enticing glimpses of Foucault's tortured upbringing, Guibert pointed up the problem of trying to understand Foucault's life without at the same time undermining his work. Foucault's writings radically undermine common sense ideas about human nature and morality that biographies inevitably rely on to make sense of their subjects. Nevertheless, the fact remains that it's a life that lends itself to biographical interpretation. When, for example, in 1946, Foucault joined the elite École Normale Supérieure in Paris, he began to behave in a way that cries out for psychological explanation. During this period, the man who was to become one of the world's foremost critics of Western attitudes to madness and sexuality seemed to suffer severe mental stress, which doctors diagnosed as being caused by his emerging homosexuality. He was reported to have made several attempts at suicide and self-mutilation, most elaborately when he slashed his chest in one of the corridors of the École Normale and was found sprawled on the floor by a teacher. 
comes across as a very tormented, unhappy, uh, tortured young man. Uh, just why, I think, is uh, certainly to me an enigma. Uh, but the episodes of self-mutilation, the uh, suicide attempts, uh, the episodes of what seems to have been some form of uh, madness that lead to his hospitalization, briefly, uh, all conjoined with a uh, preoccupation which was striking to his classmates with the Marquis de Sade very early on, uh, or decorating his room with uh, Goya etchings of uh, the tortured of war. Uh, it's an unusual and somewhat unsettling and disquieting package. Whether prompted by these experiences or not, Foucault became increasingly interested in psychiatry and madness, a move that fitted in well with a post-war generation struggling to free itself of the dominant influence of political intellectuals like Sartre and de Beauvoir. Well, it meant for them to discover something that was not less uh, critical of modern democratic bourgeois society, but on the contrary, to find uh, philosophical sources that were more radical, more critical, and also to search out thinkers that were more uh, psychological and, uh, I might say, spiritual. That's why uh, the experience of the Surrealists was so important for uh, this group of thinkers. In 1947, a key event took place that many regard as symbolizing the moment of the new generation's intellectual birth. Tonight, friends, we shall embark on a unique theatrical experiment. In this very cockpit, we will stir up... It was a theatrical performance given by the legendary French avant-garde artist and actor Antoine Artaud. Fresh out of psychiatric hospital, Artaud attempted to enact what he called a theatre of cruelty, a performance that would lay bare on the open stage his inner torments. But deep in our interior... Artaud's last performance created an electrifying effect in Paris uh, because it marked, I think, implicitly to many young <laughs> students, such as Foucault, uh, a, a tangible break with the preoccupations of Sartre, de Beauvoir, the group around Le Temps Moderne, uh, the extremity of the performance, the volatility of the emotions that were on display, the sense uh, of uncertainty as to what extent what Artaud was doing was theater, or rather the involuntary ejaculations of a madman. There's nothing like an insane asylum to tenderly incubate death. Oh, Dada, there rises again the old warrior of the insurgent cruelty, the unspeakable cruelty of living and having no being that can justify you. War will replace the father and mother. The question of when is uh, a person mad and the uncertainty of how you draw the line, particularly when that person is a public figure in the midst of a creative act is very suggestive for Foucault. It was this problem of identifying the dividing line between madness and sanity that was to become the preoccupying theme of Foucault's first great work, his doctoral thesis that was published under the title Madness and Civilization. It was a truly startling debut, announcing a major new talent with its use of strange evocative imagery. À la fin du Moyen Âge, La lèpre disparaît du monde occidental. At the end of the Middle Ages, leprosy disappeared from the Western world. In the margins of the community, at the gates of cities, there stretched wastelands which sickness had ceased to haunt, but had left sterile and long uninhabitable. For centuries, these reaches would belong to the non-human. They would wait, soliciting with strange incantations a new incarnation of disease, another grimace of terror, renewed rites of purification and exclusion. Something new appears in the imaginary landscape of the Renaissance. Soon it will occupy a privileged place there. The Ship of Fools. 
a strange drunken boat that glides along the calm rivers of the Rhineland and the Flemish canals. It is possible that these ships of fools, which haunted the imagination of the entire early Renaissance, were pilgrimage boats, highly symbolic cargoes of madmen, in search of their reason. The Ship of Fools is a very powerful image in Foucault because it brings out his notion of an ambivalence in the figure of the mad person. We're not here dealing with somebody who is psychiatrically ill in the modern sense. We are dealing with a cultural figure who is both good and bad, who is creative but also fearsome. On the Ship of Fools, it's a bit like an excursion. It's, it's a journey down the, the river of life. It is part and parcel of everybody's experience. Behind the revelation of madness as a power rather than a disability lay a deeper and more unsettling insight that science and rationality, those twin peaks of human achievement, might themselves be inhumane, turning the medieval figure of the fool into the modern figure of the freak. An orthodoxy had come about in the thinking of the history of psychiatry that roughly speaking went as follows. That the further back you went, the worse mad people were treated. They were neglected, they were beaten, they were whipped, they were expelled from society. Foucault totally stood that explanation on its head. Instead of this sort of optimistic, liberal, warm and cosy vision of the history of madness, the history of psychiatry that people had been putting forward, Foucault emphasized that things in some sense had got worse. The more the more people cared, the less people cured, the more people intervened, the more they oppressed. The message of madness and civilization was certainly controversial, but not simply because it questioned cherished beliefs. Its methods too broke the rules. It was neither a conventional work of philosophy nor of history. It seemed instead to rely on a new way of writing, one that was more concerned with excavating madness's powerful archetypes its imaginary as well as actual presence in each age. Well, I think when madness and civilization first appeared, it caused something of a, of a shock, especially for historians, because it was such a different way of going about doing things. It's not just that he talked about insanity as coming out of an earlier tradition of treating people who were outsiders in some kind of way. It's not just the creation of a category of deviance, it's the idea of relating it to the basic nature of Western culture. As a scholar, I have total contempt for Foucault. He was a liar and he was a fraud. Right? He, was, he, he pretended to knowledge that he did not have. He was a man of high, very high IQ. If he had put the time in to master the areas he should have, if he had really done the inquiries he should have, be beginning by studying ancient history, by studying anthropology, studying political science, and being honest by, about his true influences, then I could respect him. I'm, I'm afraid people who admire Foucault uh, uh, feel the slick, glossy surface and think that in some sense it's depth and it isn't. Fraud or not, superficial or not, Foucault certainly got a reaction. Madness and civilization confirming his position on the world intellectual stage and establishing a way of examining modern life that was to be distinctively his for the coming decade. Foucault greeted his newfound status in a typically non-conformist fashion by trying to escape it. In the mid-1960s, he embarked on a new academic career in Tunisia. May 68, the month of Paris's eruption into political chaos, found him teaching philosophy at the University of Tunis. He listened to the night of the barricades over the phone, a friend in France holding the handset to a radio so he could hear for himself the revolutionary uproar. Foucault returned to France in late 1968 to find a highly charged political environment, one in which his unorthodox views were eagerly sought. He supported political militancy. He backed a prisoners' rights organization which mobilized a number of prison protests. And he regularly taunted France's most cherished institutions. Alors, au fond, quand le juge demande à l'accusé de se reconnaître coupable, d'accepter sa faute, littéralement de s'humilier devant lui, au fond, le juge, on a l'impression qu'il qu veut effectivement euh, piétiner l'accusé. Moi, je dirais, c'est tout le contraire, il lui demande un formidable service. Il demande à l'accusé de lui dire au fond ceci, « Eh bien, oui, monsieur le juge, ce n'est pas tellement vous qui jugez, c'est la société tout entière, c'est cette société à laquelle j'appartiens, 
Et par conséquent, si je réclame ma peine, c'est donc moi qui me punis moi-même, et ce n'est pas vous. Je vous innocente, vous, juge. En 1970, Foucault became professor of the history of systems of thought here at the Collège de France, a very grand title for a position at a very grand institution, a place where France's finest were given the time and resources they needed to develop their ideas. It was here at the very summit of French life that Foucault started probing even further into its depths, into the underworld of crime and punishment. In 1975, Foucault published Discipline and Punish, which began with an 18th century description of the torture and execution of Damion for his attempted murder of Louis XV. Le bourreau prit les pinces d'acier. The executioner took the steel pincers and pulled first at the calf of the right leg, then at the thigh, and then at the breasts. Then the ropes that were to be harnessed to the horses were attached with cords to the patient's body. The horses tugged hard. After two or three attempts, the executioner drew out a knife from his pocket and cut the body. The four horses gave a tug and carried off the two thighs after them. Having set out in almost salacious detail the spectacular violence of this medieval ritual, he went on to describe a very different form of punishment, taken from an account published just 80 years later. Rising. At the first drum roll, the prisoners must rise and dress in silence as the supervisor opens the cell doors. At the second drum roll, they must be dressed and make their beds. At the third, they must line up and proceed to the chapel for morning prayer. Work. Prisoners go down into the courtyard, where they must wash their hands and faces and receive their first ration of bread. Immediately afterwards, they form into work teams and go off to work. In a sense, all of Discipline and Punish is in the first ten pages. The, the stark contrast between the hideous, botched torture of uh, the would-be regicide, Damia, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the, the numbing uh, prison yard routine. Uh, these two images govern the whole architecture of the book. And it seems to me they work on two different levels. On the one hand, the numbing mechanical routine becomes a metaphor for our society. And the book is a critique of this society. And by the same token, the death by torture implicitly is being put forward as a kind of calibrated ritual, not necessarily an act of blind savagery that we should say was horrible and we're glad to be done with it. End of discussion. Foucault was by no means endorsing the use of torture as a form of punishment, but he refused to dismiss it. Instead, he sought to explain it, to see how such spectacles of agonizing retribution acknowledged the desire for vengeance that the prison system conceals. By understanding this, Foucault is suggesting, we might better understand the violence in ourselves, the violence that finds such forceful expression in popular culture. In the battlefield of life, and I was willing to mind my own business, but you couldn't leave it alone, could you? The violence that seems constantly to unsettle any sense of stable morality. Foucault thus challenges us to examine the assumptions that underlie such morality, to go beyond good and evil. One can't be squeamish in thinking about Foucault and violence, thinking about popular justice, uh, thinking about uh, revenge. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. To say goodbye to morality must mean to say goodbye to being revolted at experiences like this, and to think about what they might or might not reveal about what it means to be human, might reveal about parts of ourselves, our souls, or our bodies that have been covered over. As well as refusing to condemn torture, Foucault also refused to endorse the prison system. It also had a symbolic role that reflected the inner workings of society. The rationalist principles that produced the prison had also produced what Foucault called panopticism, the state as the all-seeing eye, modelled on the panoptical prison design first proposed by the British reformer Jeremy Bentham. On the periphery, an annular building. In the centre, a tower. It then suffices to place a supervisor in the central tower and a madman, a patient, a condemned man, a worker or a schoolboy. 
in each cell. So many cages, so many little theatres, in which each actor is alone, perfectly individualised and constantly visible. Full light and the gaze of a supervisor capture better than darkness, which was ultimately a protection. Visibility is a trap. Prisons are something that, by and large, most of us don't have anything to do with. And he made them visible by showing us how the very architectural construction of the space in the prison serves a whole range of other functions, and why it is that separate cells, long hallways, central courtyards, exercise arenas, suddenly then are not neutral, and then, when we then go to the high schools that we, we were all raised in, we suddenly see a range of the same kind of spatial arrangements, and begins to raise questions about why is it that classrooms are, the, are arranged in the way they are? Why is it that there are doors on the toilets? The power of Foucault's work on discipline and punishment is not that it offers any solutions, but that it poses unsettling questions. How convincing is modern scientific society's pious belief in its own progress? Is humanism really so humane? In the spring of 1975, Foucault visited America. Feeling increasingly trapped by his fame in France, he had developed a passion for the place, for the rich diversity of sensual as well as intellectual opportunities it offered. It was his new frontier. One day, he decided to accompany two friends on a drive into the desert. Their chosen destination was popular among Californians at the time, Death Valley, one of the hottest and most hostile places on Earth. They arrived in the evening and parked at Zabriskie Point, overlooking the valley. They took LSD, played Stockhausen, and watched the night draw in. For at least one biographer, this moment symbolizes a turning point in Foucault's life, the point at which his interest turned from a critique of society towards more contemplative philosophical themes, the meaning of life, the self and death. In writing my book, I was struck that every single person that I spoke with had heard about Foucault's experience in Death Valley. He invariably reported that this was the greatest experience in his life, the most transformative, important experience in his life. And this is saying something because this was a life punctuated by adventurous, uh, interesting, important experiences. By taking LSD, by disorganizing his thoughts and taking that risk for the first time, Foucault was led to think in new ways about both himself and his sexuality. During the 70s, Foucault's attachment to America deepened, and so too its attachment to him. He became a cult figure, an exotic focus for campus radicalism. No, you see, uh, uh, when I am in the States, I look at uh, American TV very often, but it's only to learn uh, English or American. But as well as academic success, Foucault also found in America, and especially California, a celebration of sexual adventure, a carnival of self-discovery neither he nor anyone had ever witnessed before. In the pre-AIDS era of the late 1970s, the bars and bathhouses of San Francisco offered a veritable theme park of erotic and narcotic adventure. Laboratories of sexual experimentation, Foucault called them. Places where practices like sadomasochism weren't treated as weird or sick, but creative and liberating. Here, man was reborn free, and everywhere he was in chains. <laughs> What he found in, in San Francisco with respect to sexuality, I think, is nicely captured in a, in a phrase that he often used to joke about. He'd say, uh, what I like about San Francisco is there's so many gays. 
and I am a homosexual. And what that meant, I think, was that he saw a, an entire culture and an entire way of life, a public way of life that had been constructed in San Francisco, among other places, but particularly here, which was so different than what than he knew and had known in France or in Tunisia around largely the same sexual acts, but the whole way of life of gay culture was something which he had never seen before and which he was simultaneously very enthralled with and very amused by. Although Foucault became a figurehead of the gay liberation movement, he never joined it, for the same reason that he rejected the Christianity of his childhood, that he never became a Marxist, an existentialist or a Freudian. For him, all such movements are the problem, not the solution to finding a philosophy of life. They all promote themselves as universal when history, he felt, shows them not to be. As he aimed to demonstrate in what turned out to be his last works on the history of sexuality, there are no universals. There isn't even a true inner self, a transcendental being that holds the secret of life or morality. It was this insight that seemed to draw him to the frivolity and excess of Californian counterculture. Through the very profusion of philosophies, he was freed from the control of any one of them. By offering such a rich diversity of experiences, an absence of limits and restraints, it provided unique conditions not for the discovery of a true self so much as the invention of one. The, the notion of invention is absolutely crucial to, to Foucault's work. And uh, giving up this idea that you have to discover a self that is sort of waiting for you, the real, the authentic, the deep self, uh, there's nothing of that sort to discover. But you have to invent yourself. The whole ethics of Foucault, both in his work and in his life, and in his work about how to lead a life, which is the synthesis of the two, uh, is about how to detach myself from myself, how to transform myself. He wanted to discover what he called an aesthetics of existence, a way of looking at life that doesn't rely on scientific categories or philosophical commandments set in stone. For him, life should be treated more as a work of art, something that can have many meanings and that can be judged in its own terms. What he is asking in those last works is what are the conditions by which a person can become the artist of his or her own life? What are the conditions which allow one to grow according to one's own sense of what one wants to become? Um, those last works are very much about becoming. They're not about uh, revealing the truth of morality. On the, quest on the contrary, they question the idea there is a truth of morality. He's not interested in morality. Morality for him is a series of external rules which oppress people. The controversial claim is that in the last years of his life, Foucault's personal quest for self-invention, for the raw material for this artistry of life, reached a new intensity, embracing sadomasochistic experiences, ascetic experiences, narcotic experiences, even, Foucault himself suggested with his usual inscrutability, near-death experiences. Uh, Foucault, uh, quite by accident, is uh, hit by a car and suffers serious uh, injuries as a result, uh, yet takes away from this experience, he says in public and to at least one friend, uh, a vision of bliss, that somehow to have uh, felt oneself to be on death's doorstep is the most pleasurable experience he's ever had. and. In the public interview, when he makes this comment, as always with Foucault, you never know whether he's being ironic or serious. It's a thin line, and I tend to think he's usually smiling, and through the Cheshire Cat's grin is something that's of the essence biographically. So you have to somehow keep the irony, but take seriously what's being told to you with the smile. On the 2nd of June 1984, Foucault collapsed in his Paris apartment. The cause was nothing to do with the injuries sustained by the car accident, which had happened several years earlier. It was the onset of AIDS. 
He was immediately taken to Salpetria Hospital, the place where he had first embarked on his studies of madness. He died there on the 25th of June, aged 57. Et puis ce matin à Paris, dernier hommage au philosophe Michel Foucault. The announcement made the national news, and at his funeral he was acclaimed one of the century's great philosophers. However, in a decision that was to add the same twist of controversy to his death that had attended so much of his life, the cause of his illness was kept secret, the hospital announcing that he had died of a brain infection. His brother, a doctor, knew the true cause, though decided to keep it to himself. C'était une impression assez, assez épouvantable parce que quand il euh, se plaignait justement de ses petits malaises plusieurs mois auparavant, j'avais dit, j'espère que ce n'est pas le signe. Je ne tenais pas à ce que ma mère le sache. Pour le reste, je m'en moquais un petit peu de ce que les gens pouvaient en penser. Eventually, the true cause of Foucault's death became public knowledge. But even as it did so, the scent of scandal remained. There were wild rumours that he had actually sought to contract the disease in some sort of final suicidal gesture. And Hervé Guibert, the writer whose stories about amputation and confinement had been taken as readings of Foucault's early life, once more intervened. In a novel about AIDS, he wrote of a philosopher once again clearly modelled on Foucault, who had deliberately returned to California after hearing about the AIDS epidemic, fascinated by the persistence of San Francisco's bathhouse scene. The truth of Guibert's typically lurid tale remains unknown, but then, like so many of Foucault's own stories, perhaps its literal truth is irrelevant. Perhaps like the story of the Ship of Fools or the torture of Damion, it acts as a highly suggestive and discomforting image that sheds light on a testing issue. The issue in this case of how AIDS relates to the idea of testing the limits of experience, whether or not it might be what lies beyond good and evil. If there is a lesson in, in anyone's horrible death in this way, I don't think it is that he wished this death. I can't believe that Foucault wished uh, his death at all, but especially this death. However, I think there is a, a lesson to be learned, which is that um, everything is not society. Everything is not a creation of ideas that behind all of that there still are biological and human facts that cannot be wished away or interpreted away. He could have died of any disease at any particular point uh, of his life. He could have lived another 20 years. Um, the fact that he died of an epidemic that was gaining a grip on the Western world at this time, I think is irrelevant to the meaning of his thought and the relevance of his thought in, in telling us something about the relationship between life and, and death. Um, for, the, for the romantic biographer, um, or for those who want to deny the validity of his own ethical choices and ethical searches, it may seem uh, a nice punctuation point. To those of us concerned with the validity of, of his search, of his journey, of his intellectual preoccupations, it's, it's like an accident on, on a, um, uh, on a difficult journey. The wider issue is whether Foucault's death or his experiences of sadomasochism or his suicide attempts or his homosexuality or his upbringing can be used to explain his work. In the process of making such links, some fear that biographers use the very mechanisms of labelling, categorising and pigeonholing that Foucault's entire work sought to challenge, that what biography provides is a construction rather than a reconstruction of the life. Well, it's making sense of him in the context of a particular project. And the particular project is a project of reaffirming our normal conventions of what is good and right, what is normal, what the best way to live is. And seeing Foucault as someone who, well, as a kind of outlaw who, um, who wandered uh, back and forth across the boundaries of what we think of as normal or rational, who was a kind of mad genius but whose genius, by being mad, simply confirms us in the pieties and complacencies of traditional morality. Les philosophes ont très longtemps échappé à la biographie. Et il y a des romanciers qui ont voulu connaître le destin des philosophes. Flaubert. Flaubert a voulu s'effacer pour ne laisser parler que son œuvre. Et bien malheureusement, 
la tentative de Flaubert a échoué. Et au lieu que ce soit les romanciers qui soient traités comme les philosophes, ce sont les philosophes qui sont traités comme les romanciers et les romanciers qui sont traités comme les acteurs de cinéma. Tout le monde aujourd'hui a droit à sa biographie. Tout le monde aujourd'hui a droit à l'indiscrétion, au commérage. Et l'œuvre, et au lieu que ce soit l'homme qui disparaisse derrière l'œuvre, c'est l'œuvre qui est dissoute dans le misérable petit tas de secrets. One of Foucault's most important contributions was to question the whole notion of man with a capital M, of some universal moral mannequin upon which we must all aim to be modeled. This man, he wrote, was himself an invention and would one day die. He will, Foucault memorably predicted, be erased like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea. Whatever kind of man Foucault may have been and whatever fate he himself met, it seems likely that his startling ideas will prove more enduring. <laughs>